Okay, dear colleagues, if everybody could take their seats, please. We will um, start the second part of our committee meeting today. Um, the main point of this afternoon's agenda is our hearing on spyware and e-privacy. Uh, with this hearing, uh, we wanted to have a discussion with experts covering the analysis of the respect of the principles of confidentiality of communications and prohibitions of interception, uh, listening, tapping, storage, etc., or surveillance of communications. Originally, we planned this for July. Uh, it has been postponed to allow the organization of the hearing on Israel ahead of the mission, but we can now delve into this topic um, into great detail. We have uh, a lot of time to do so, and I want to thank uh, the participants for uh, making themselves available this afternoon. We'll have two panels. Uh, the first panel will have three speakers, uh, Angel Vallejo, uh, head of the institutional relations at uh, Thibech, Jesper Lund, uh, chairman of IT Poll, uh, who is a member of EDRI, who will be participating remotely, and uh, Wojciech Klitki, who is a lawyer from the Panopticon Foundation. Uh, the second panel this afternoon will hear from Yanis Kuvakas, who is a senior legal officer and legal coordinator of Privacy International, and uh, Achim Klabunde from the Deutsche Vereinigung für Datenschutz. Uh, so, without further ado, I see I get a confirmation from my pronunciation of the German. Thank you very much, Hanna. Uh, we will start with uh, Mr. Angel Vallejo, who is the head of institutional license at Thibeg, a cybersecurity think tank based in Spain. You have the floor for 10 minutes, please. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you for the invitation. It's a honor to be here and thank you for, for having me. Um, I'm the head of institutional relationships of, of Ciber. It's, that's a cybersecurity think tank based in, in Spain. And we usually deal with uh, cybersecurity issues, cyber strategy, social cyber development. And the think tank is composed by engineers, lawyers, soci sociologists, and political science practitioners. We uh, founded the think tank and we, we wanted to, to um, apply a multi-perspective and multidisciplinary approach to all this cyber um, environment in order to, to avoid a very or kind of biased uh, approach. And uh, we've been working for, I think it's about 10 years now. Okay. So let me first um, let me first mention uh, as a reference point uh, the UN Commissioner for Human Rights report of October 2022, which is addressing mainly three topics. First of all is uh, the abuse of spyware by state authorities. Second one is encryption as a potential right or a potential new right. And third one is the abuse of surveillance in public spaces. We shall address the first one because this is the topic to be uh, uh, discussed today. And uh, we can leave the other two for a uh, later stage if there is some time left because they are, they are uh, very tightly related. Okay. So, Pegasus, what's new if there is something new? Uh, we'll know that. Uh, this uh, tool turns smartphone into 24/7 surveillance device. Uh, it's a, it provides a zero-click attack, so it's a kind of game changer in 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 which respects to the need of some kind of activation by the victim device. And we know it's been sold. This uh, tool has been sold to some of the uh, European. Uh, countries. Um, the, without entering into detail of, of technicalities, the uh, game-changing part of this uh, tool, this Pegasus, is that the, 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 the point of, of, of zero-click attack, uh, first of all, and secondly, but not less important, uh, that it provides a practically um, unlimited possibility and likelihood of uh, exfiltering or um, sniffing all and every single piece of information, uh, voice and data, who is uh, running through onto and out of the, of the device. Um, 
we can we can of course recall the um hacking team issue it was a uh, I think it was uh, 2014. So it's uh, uh, something important that, that after eight, eight years, we are now in a kind of similar situation which we uh, encountered in 2014. In that case, in the case of, of uh, Hacking Team, the, this uh, tool provided by the, by the um, um, Italian company, it was not so uh, pervasive. It was it was not so fully uh, intervening the uh, contents of the device, and it was let's say uh, a little more easier to detect than the uh, Pegasus. So with this little frame of of some um, technical or, or not technical but but um, uh, features of this uh, tool. Uh, we have to. We would like to address uh, some um, ideas, which uh, we understand that sackers very closely the, the the present status of the of all the Pegasus-related uh, um, situation. First, we understand that it again we have to, to stress the never-ending bridge between the velocity of technology development and we have and the and the and the velocity of regulation to control technical possible indesirable byproducts of this technology it's uh, we all know we, we live in, in a world in which in which technology uh, takes a, a pace which is almost impossible to follow by the authorities but by police and by intelligent agencies and that poses a serious trouble in order to prevent or address the problems Caused by caused by these uh, these uh, devices and this uh, or to say best this software and and these tools. Second important idea in our opinion is the failure, uh, not but maybe not the failure but the lack of the e e EU uh, possibility to intervene ex ante or exposed on the national security issues of member states, and that's as you um, already know that connects with the Article 4, um, Paragraph 2 of the Treaty of European Union, uh, which mainly leaves the, all the matters re referred to uh, national security on the hands of a, any member state. It literally says that national security remains the sole responsibility of each member state. So that pose some frictions in order to try to prevent or regulate or enforce some laws uh, issued within the European, within the European Union. Um, following next big idea, as a kind of remedy to the rule of, of uh, non-intervention, member states mostly share certain principles for white tapping or intercepting communication or data flows. Um, I think it's, it's almost the same for, for the main part of the uh, countries of, of, the, of uh, Europe, but, but it's not exactly the same. Just to have a very brief, a very brief reference, um, in Spain, in order to have a court authorization, a court permit to intercept or intervene some device uh, affecting communications, as far as it affects uh, privacy rights, it's uh, in need of the evidencing of uh, the necessity. Uh, this uh, intervention should have is, is, is necessary, um, affected by proportionality, uh, exceptionality, suitability, and speciality, and of course. Last but not least, uh, this intervention, this white tapping, this uh, um, uh, authority intervention, always controlled by the judges, uh, should be s uh, set with a, a maximum duration. It's uh, three months in, with extensions. In, in, I'm, I'm referring to, to Spain. Okay. So it, there are some cases in which the uh, interception of communications, so this kind of breach of, of privacy, uh, should or can be done without the intervention, without the order of a, of a court, of a judge. But uh, even in that uh, 
uh, in those very, very exceptional cases, it's very important that the court uh, making or carrying out the investigation uh, is obliged to control the previous uh, interception of this um, um, communication. So, um, with this kind of, of restrictions in mind, can we, can we consider the Pegasus or the like uh, tools can attach to those restrictions? Here we have, uh, to our understanding, we have two different uh, views in, uh, in Europe. The uh, European Data Protection Supervisor thinks that that's not possible because of the features presented by Pegasus. We will enter into that very briefly in, in a moment. As a fourth big idea, uh, we have a, in, in, in Europe, we have a export control of uh, dual use products, including cyber surveillance products, uh, which are su uh, subject to uh, export control legislation. Um, but we haven't got any, uh, let's say, similar legislation to control imports. So let's say that we European state members, we are kind of protecting third countries uh, uh, on the possibility of their governments receiving uh, tools very invasive or very um, intrusive and for, the, for the affection of the, of the communications. And we in Europe, we haven't got this kind of export control which should prevent this, uh, the same thing happening in, uh, within Europe. Um, that's one of the, well, another one of the, of the points that the, the um, supervisor uh, brings out in his uh, report. Uh, as a sixth idea, we will mention very briefly the old controversy between uh, security and versus freedom. Um, and we think that this is uh, something to be uh, addressed by or with the use of uh, citizen education. Uh, we know that all the uh, electronic applications, mobile applications, uh, no one of us read the terms and conditions. We should all do that. So we are uh, very, um, let's say, happily uh, rendering or waving up our uh, rights in terms of privacy and secret of communication to big tech companies. This is a, a point that we think should be addressed. Um, which are, to be ending, uh, which are the, the main or couple of ideas regarding the, uh, the use of, of intrusive hacking tools like the, the Pegasus. We first have this uh, common, let's say, or let's call it alibi from, from the state authorities. We, we use that to fight crime. That's a dangerous but common statement. And uh, just briefly quoting the United Nations report, it said, while purportedly being deployed for combating, for combating terrorism and crime, such spyware tools have often been used for illegitimate reasons, including to clap down on critical, on dissenting views and on those who express them, including journalists, opposition, political figures, and human rights defenders. Another very important idea, idea. if these tools were to be used, if uh, the, the conclusion is that it can or it should be used in some very exceptional cases, uh, there is a kind of a renunciable uh, last resort principle. And I will just quote again the United Nations uh, report. Authorities should only electronically intrude on a personal device as a last resort to prevent or investigate a specific act amounting to a serious threat to national security or a specific serious crime. So uh, let me end just by saying that we perceive a kind of not well, I, we can say it's a contradiction between the, the positions of the Commission and the position of the, of the um, um, a supervisor, of the European Data Protection Supervisor, with regards to what to do. The Commission considers that they can, the, 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 um, uh, the board cannot intervene in these issues because, because it affects, it's affecting uh, 
uh, national security issues. On the, on the, the other hand, the supervisor considers that a full ban of these tools should be uh, opposed. So I think that opens uh, a lot of discussion and we are um, open to comment after that. Thank you very much. No, thank you very much for your, um, for your presentation. And I think, in, indeed, I think from this committee, nobody really agrees with the, the European Commission that this is a matter of national security because we very much view it as a, as a rule of law issue, uh, especially given the fact that this kind of spyware has been used against activists, journalists, opposition politicians, uh, prosecutors, judges, etc. So uh, I think that the European Commission is now slowly but surely embarking on a path where they also recognise that so we, we, we keep an eye on that. But many of the issues you, you mentioned, whether it's on import-export uh, controls, whether it's about last resort principles, are, are very much also part of our debate. So I'm sure there'll be many questions on that. Uh, before we do that, though, we move to uh, our second guest of today, who is remotely connected, Mr Jesper Lund, who is the chairman of uh, IT Poll, which is the um, uh, IT political association of Denmark. It's a Danish digital rights organization that works to promote privacy and freedom in the information society. Thank you very much for joining us, Mr. Lund, and you also have 10 minutes to make your presentation. Thank you. Um, dear members of the uh, PEGA committee, um, thank you for inviting me to speak about spyware and e privacy today. European Digital Rights is a network of civil society organizations that work to defend and advance digital rights across Europe. I'm chairman of the Danish member ITPOL and representing ETRI today. In my intervention, I will first consider whether the existing e-privacy framework offers legal protection against spyware. Secondly, I will suggest possible ways forward for improving the legal protection against spyware by other instruments of EU law. Um, the main instrument to protect confidentiality of communications or in general in EU law is, of course, the privacy directive. Uh, we are still waiting for the privacy regulation to be adopted, even though the proposal was presented in January 2017, almost six years ago. The e privacy directive applies first and foremost to providers of publicly available communication services. And the directive protects confidentiality of communications by requiring service providers to delete or anonymize communications content and metadata after transmission of the communication. This is a main rule with some limited exceptions. The Court of Justice has interpreted the e-privacy directive in a number of cases about national data retention laws and access to stored data by public authorities. A common aspect of the cases decided so far is that the national laws in question impose obligations on private service providers to either retain data or disclose data to public authorities. Since these measures require processing by service providers, they constitute restrictions um, of the rights and obligations provided for by the privacy directive. The restrictions in question must in national law must uh, satisfy the conditions of Article 15, Paragraph 1 of the um, e-privacy uh, directive interpreted in that of the Charter, including in particular Article 52. So this has the effect of bringing national laws within the scope of the e-privacy directive and hence EU law, even if the purpose of national law is safeguarding national security, which is noteworthy. In this particular case, member states cannot circumvent the protection under EU law by invoking broad definitions of national security. However, and this is important to emphasize, the critical connection here to the privacy directive is the processing obligations for service providers. In paragraph 103 of the Lacroix de Surety Net ruling from October 2020, the Court of Justice specifically states that if member states derogate from the protection of confidentiality of communications, without imposing obligations on service providers, the protection of personal data is not covered by the privacy directive. In that case, it is only covered by national law, possibly subject to application of the Law Enforcement Data Protection Directive. I will now turn to the question of whether the privacy directive and the associated case law from the Court of Justice is applicable to national laws on deployment of spyware by either law enforcement or intelligence services. <clears throat> 
So the first thing to note here is that spyware, such as Pegasus from NSO Group, is deployed by exploiting software vulnerabilities on the devices, for example, smartphones, of the persons targeted by this intrusive surveillance measure. So put it bluntly, by hacking their devices. The interference with the device is done either <coughs> sorry, <coughs> the interference with the device is done either directly by state authorities or with assistance of a spyware vendor such as NSO. In terms of the privacy directive, the spyware vendors are clearly not providers of electronic communications services. And since the deployment of spyware is done entirely without any processing by a provider covered by the privacy directive, the case law of the Court of Justice would suggest that the privacy directive does not apply to the processing of personal data, in this case involving spyware deployment. However, there are other factual differences between the deployment of spyware and the cases considered by the Court of Justice so far. This creates an alternative connection to the privacy directive, which does not require processing by providers of electronic communications services. Article 5.3 of the privacy directive protects the user's terminal equipment against interference, and the definition of terminal equipment also covers smartphone devices. Uh, often referred to as the cookie law, the storing of information or gaining access to already stored information in the user's terminal equipment is only allowed with the consent of the end user. The only exception to consent is if the processing is strictly necessary for an information society service explicitly requested by the user. The important thing here is that, unlike other provisions of the privacy directive, the scope of Article 5.3 is not limited to providers of electronic communication services. It applies more broadly. Since Turning to spyware, since the conditions in Article 5.3 are clearly not satisfied for the deployment of spyware, it could be argued that the deployment constitutes a restriction of the right to protection of terminal equipment afforded by the e-privacy directive, and that this restriction is subject, again, to Article, 5, sorry, Article 15, Paragraph 1 of the e-privacy directive. This would put national laws on spyware within the scope of the e-privacy directive, similar to national data retention laws. Uh, so there's sort of one argument in favor and one argument against the e-privacy directive applying. Um, and very interestingly, there's a case pending before the Court of Justice, which could perhaps resolve the legal uncertainty about the applicability of the privacy directive to spyware. The uh, case number 548-21 from Austria is about extracting information from a mobile device with physical access, so not entirely the same as deployment of spyware. But the case is still similar in terms of the possible interference with the user's terminal equipment, and in particular, the lack of processing obligations for service providers. Besides the privacy directive, deployment of spyware could of course be regulated in EU law in, in other ways. Um, and the first to consider here is the hopefully future e-privacy regulation. Um, as the text currently stands with Parliament and Council positions in trilogue negotiations, the privacy directive will have largely the same scope as the current directive. This also means the same limitations with regard to possible protection against spyware. Um, another option to consider is the recent proposal for the European, European Media Freedom Act, um, which takes a much more direct approach to regulating the deployment of spyware by member states. Article 4 of the proposal creates rights for media service providers, which include protection against deployment of spyware, though with some exceptions for member states. These exceptions, uh, in my opinion, are rather broad and leave basically so much discretion for member states that the protection could easily be undermined. However, this part of the proposal could and should be, be strengthened in, with, with amendments, um, and it certainly shows a way forward. A similar and preferably stronger protection of the confidentiality of communications against the deployment of spyware could be extended to all individuals in the European Union in a future legislative proposal, um, I will conclude my intervention by highlighting two reasons for the importance of having effective protection against spyware in EU law. The first reason is the abuses of Pegasus and other spyware uncovered by the investigations of civil society organizations, journalists, and the work of this committee. Um, 
national laws of member states to simply not provide adequate protection and safeguards. EU law should address this and uphold the protection of fundamental rights. <coughs> Sorry. The second reason is to counterbalance the increased information exchange between member states in parts facilitated by EU law and EU agencies. The recently amended Europol regulation allows Europol to receive and analyze large data sets from member states for possible distribution to other member states. Large data sets in this connection can include electronic communications data obtained from bulk collection operations involving spyware. The uh, EncroChat investigation is an example of that. Unlike Traditional wiretapping of telephone services, spyware can be easily deployed across national borders. This means that protection against spyware in national law can easily be undermined if other member states can deploy spyware, especially if done in an indiscriminate manner, and then share the information obtained through Europol or other uh, channels. So to prevent a race to the bottom for fundamental rights, uh, EU law should therefore set minimum legal standards for the deployment of spyware by member states. The uh, ATRI position paper on encryption, published last Friday on Encryption Day, offers concrete proposals on how state hacking, as we prefer to call it, can be regulated. This concludes my intervention. I thank you for your attention and look forward to your questions. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Lund, for your presentation, also for uh, putting some um, putting some homework on our table with, with regards to the legislative files that this parliament is already working on or will start working on very soon. I think that's very helpful. Maybe also, and this also goes for Mr. Mr. Vallejo, uh, if there are any um, any written notes uh, of your interventions available, and if you'd be willing to share them with us, that would be very helpful because there was a lot of information there, and it would be good if we could could read it back in um, uh, in uh, in due time as well. Now I turn to our third speaker, Mr. Wojciech Klitski, who is a lawyer representing the Panopticon Foundation. It was established in April 2009 upon the initiative of a group of engaged lawyers to express their opposition to surveillance. Their mission is to protect fundamental rights and freedoms in the context of fast-changing technologies and growing surveillance. So I would pass the uh, floor for 10 minutes as well to Mr. Klitschke, and I would also ask the members in the room who would like to participate in the Q&A session afterwards to already indicate their willingness so we can make the speakers list. You have the floor for 10 minutes, Mr. Klitschke. Members of the committee, thank you very much for inviting me here to speak. The use of uh, spying technology against European citizens is, of course, a huge challenge, particularly when it comes to uh, private life, uh, law, and the whole democratic procedure. And so the work that you do as a parliamentary committee is particularly important here. I'd like to start my presentation by saying a few words about the Polish context, particularly in light of the fact that this is the situation that I know best, but also some of the challenges facing both your committee and Europe as a whole. And then I'd like to set out some of the um, actions that I believe the Commission could take. Now, just to give you a bit of context and set out the scope of the challenge you're facing, I'd like to tell you about Poland very briefly, because I think it's a good starting point to look at some of the changes that we need. Currently in Poland, certain European provisions are not covered by Polish law, and nor is European uh, Court of Justice case law. For instance, when it comes to protection of private life, there are certain provisions that exist when it comes to protection of personal data. This is a directive that is poorly implemented in Poland, if at all. There are some uh, individual freedoms that are restricted in light of uh, national security, but there are other areas that are entirely excluded from this. The Central Bureau uh, 
uh, the Anti-Corruption Bureau, the CBA, has actually used the Pegasus uh, software for proper implementation of the law enforcement directive the european data protection officer has actually quoted this example there is another example that i think should draw your attention polish legislators ignores uh, law coming from the court of justice when it comes to online confidentiality. So the Polish courts actually set out the authorities under which Polish authorities can have access to this type of data. At the same time, the courts say that you can't have a general ban on uh, holding data. Uh, whereas that is not in line with what is said by the Court of Justice. There is no uh, control when it comes to access to data in Poland, and there are no uh, exclusions, exemptions. So that's uh, briefly about Poland. I think it's also important to look at what was um, ruled on by uh, the Court of Justice in last month. There were a number of cases against Poland. I was actually involved in these cases. And the Court of Human Rights ruling will have to look at uh, what Poland's doing and will have to either amend or develop its guidelines when it comes to state surveillance. Um, we've seen this in cases against Russia, for example, and also Hungary. I would like to also, um, in my presentation, speak briefly about the use of uh, Pegasus and other spyware, which are going to require a both a national and European response. At national level, we're going to have to create some kind of uh, special intelligence services, which will um, be properly supervised by courts or um, appropriate bodies. And it's also important to keep in mind that both the Court of Human Rights and the Court of Justice say that um, there should be mechanisms that surveillance authorities are subject to and that appeals should be possible in cases of abuses. I believe that what's most important at European level is that we should be able to limit or at least take proper account of the challenges faced by national security. The Court of Justice is moving in the direction of saying that even though uh, member states may invoke the need to protect the state's vital interests or national security, uh, they must nonetheless provide for legal guarantees for people whose rights are infringed. And I would also like to say that this issue of uh, national security as a criterion that can be used to limit the implementation of European law is also important when it comes to other fields of legislation, for example, artificial intelligence. So uh, that was my first point. Secondly, I believe it's necessary to do everything possible to ensure that member states are respecting uh, European legislation currently in force, uh, for example, the law enforcement directive when it comes to Poland. Furthermore, for a number of reasons, I believe that we need a regulation, not a directive, but a, um, a regulation on online security uh, and protection. And this should be worded in such a way that will ensure that uh, surveillance of uh, 
private uh, communications and so forth can be done in line with most recent rulings from the courts, which say that the Charter of Fundamental Rights have to be respected. Fourthly, I believe that individual rights have to be strengthened in criminal law. Criminal law proceedings should not be uh, using tools such as Pegasus. And here I would just mention the role of on the um, European Data Protection Officer, who, based on the European treaties, has said that the EU could adopt minimal legislation when it comes to the rights of individuals in criminal uh, proceedings, including when it comes to admiss admissibility of evidence. Um, and so the question of admissibility of evidence obtained through the use of Pegasus is one that will have to be looked at. And then uh, when it comes to the question of tools such as uh, Pegasus and spyware in general, it's part of a broader debate on the rule of law, independence of uh, the justice system, the media. Uh, this is all linked to the use of Pegasus. There's a lack of proper scrutiny when it comes to the application of certain tools, and uh, we will never, it will never be uh, properly affected, effective sorry, unless there are independent and impartial courts. The rule of law crisis should be seen as a priority and should be seen in close uh, link with uh, spyware and the use of this type of software. Thank you very much, and I'm open to any questions you may have. Yes, thank you. Uh, thank you very much. I'll jump immediately into the uh, question and answers with the members. We'll take them uh, one question per, uh, per member, and then we give all the panellists the opportunity to answer. We'll start with Bartosz Alukovic. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Chair. I have a question for Mr. Klitsky. Well, I have a number of questions, in fact. Your uh, foundation, your organisation, it looked at the situation in Poland and in Europe. But I would just like to ask, um, do you know or have you heard of any uh, legal proceedings where uh, people responsible for terrorist acts or someone who has broken the law has been brought to court on the basis of information obtained through Pegasus. Are you aware of any case like that in Europe or in Poland? That would be my first question. Secondly, again on Poland. In Poland, Pegasus was used to spy on Szeftow Brazer, who was head of the uh, opposition's election campaign. Do you believe that the use of Pegasus of Poland against uh, lawyers and politicians, uh, public prosecutors, uh, magistrates, could all of this have an impact on the results of the elections, particularly European elections? Could this mass surveillance have any influence on the parliamentary elections? and the European parliamentary elections. And then thirdly, the fact that you can, um, for example, insert data into the person's telephone. You could include uh, uh, criminal paedophile images, for example. So could Pegasus have an impact on the way in which sentences are handed down based on um, information that had been created, fabricated and put on their phones through the use of Pegasus? Okay, there were three, uh, three concrete questions to Mr. Klitsky, but I think uh, in, in general, especially the second and the third question, is also very relevant in the, in the broader context. I will also ask the other panellists to respond to that. But first, Mr. Klitsky. Thank you for those questions. Firstly, have there been any sentences that have been uh, ruled 
based on information obtained through the use of Pegasus? Well, this is a question being asked by all experts, and there are a lot of discussions about this topic. Personally, I'm not aware of any such cases. Uh, defence lawyers uh, and other people who I've spoken to don't have any information of this nature. However, to be quite honest, I do have to say that Um, people who uh, have committed crimes or have been uh, sentenced um, might not be aware of it. Um, it. It could be possible that um, that uh, lawyers don't know that the tool has also been used, for instance, to uh, monitor discussions or some proof could have been obtained through the use of Pegasus without people knowing. When it comes to Senator Brazer who was the former head of the um, main opposition party's election campaign and, and what impact uh, the use of spyware may have on elections. Well, of course, I can't give you a clear and ambiguous answer. The gov governing party has acted, but was it based directly on information obtained through uh, surveillance of Mr. Brazer. Um, for example, we know that he was um, indicted based on some information uh, that was obtained through Pegasus. How much of an impact did that have on the elections as a whole? Well, it's very difficult to say. Of course, we have to remember uh, who the crime benefits, who could have drawn benefit from this. If we know that um, information obtained through his phone could have been exploited and used by the governing pa party, then of course we have to imagine that that would have had an impact on the elections. But if, again, this is not just about... Um, a, a, protection of individual data, but also protection for the democratic process as a whole. Then um, what about fabricated evidence or evidence that's been installed through Pegasus operators on telephones? Again, I don't know if any judges have handed down sentences based on this type of information introduced through Pegasus. I can't say. I don't know if this type of manipulation has taken place or if uh, data has been put on people's phones. But there is information available about these types of tools being used to manipulate data uh, and to compromise people. This has happened in India, I believe. There have been two cases at least where this type of manipulation has happened and has been detected. Now, of course, it's very difficult to clearly establish that uh, certain material was fabricated or introduced through spyware, but um, there were a couple of cases where the um, those responsible committed errors. Or where they uh, included the metadata in uh, the fabricated data. So the documents were on the phone, but they were never opened or edited on that phone. So it couldn't be used as um, evidence when uh, trying someone. If you also want to uh, reply to the broader question on, on democracy, elections and, uh, and the use of this kind of spyware. Yes, please. Please. Um, can talk in Spanish this? Yeah. Your answer? Um, respecto a la cuestión del... On the possible influence it could have on democratic processes. We know that in Spain, for example, they've raised the issue of potential contamination of certain electoral procedures and a certain influence 
and that influence would be based on uh, potential surveillance carried out through uh, spyware tools. We know that in Spain at the moment there are certain investigations underway on this, but as far as I know, there hasn't been any. There haven't been any rulings yet on this. And then on the question about sentences, rulings, not uh, in the election procedure, but cr criminal proceedings. The criminal um, system in Spain is such that the um, prosecution has to um, establish both the source and origin of any uh, evidence and when it was intercepted. If interception or detection hasn't been authorised by a judge or by uh, a court or a judge investigating a specific crime, in about 99% of cases, then this evidence will be ruled inadmissible. And also, if it, a court discovers that the source of some kind of evidence is obtained through Pegasus or another type of spyware software, it's likely that, again, this information will be deemed inadmissible, and particularly when it comes to handing down a sentence. So if it's clear that information obtained through Pegasus or spyware tools um, it has been used in a court, it's likely that this will be taken out. It will not be um, admitted into the criminal proceedings. Thank you, Mr. Lund. I'm not sure if you also would like to add to this, but if so, you have the floor. Yes, uh, thank you. Uh, I would uh, like to comment briefly uh, on, the, on the topic of uh, notification, which was uh, raised by the, uh, by, by the question, uh, in, and in particular in, in relation to spyware. How does the person concerned become aware that um, he or she has been subjected to this intrusive uh, surveillance measure, uh, in particular if there isn't a criminal trial where information from the devices is introduced as, as evidence? Um, and this is an, a situation where it would be really useful if the uh, e privacy directive also applied to the deployment of spyware, because the case law from the Court of Justice is very clear there must be a notification of the person concerned in all cases. Uh, so even if there isn't a criminal trial, in order to exercise the rights under the Charter of Fundamental Rights, uh, including the right to an effective remedy, there, there must be a notification of, of, of the data subject. Um, if EU law does not apply to this case, uh, in principle, there is a similar requirement in also, there's a similar uh, right to an effective remedy in Article 13 of the of the European Convention of Human Rights. But the case law from the European Court of Human Rights uh, may give uh, member states a greater margin of appreciation as to not notifying the uh, the, the person concerned by by the measure. Um, but it's. Uh, um, I think it's a critical issue for, for the deployment of spyware, also because the situation is different from traditional interception methods. There's no service provider who can perhaps insist on notification on, on behalf of, of, of the person concerned. So ideally, this should be ensured through improved oversight uh, to ensure that notification is, is made in all cases. Thank you. Yes, thank you. That's a very, uh, very useful uh uh, addition. Thank you so much, Mr. Lund. Uh, Mr. Lopez Aguiar. Yeah, thank you, Chair. My question also goes to Mr. Klitschke, Polish lawyer, specialist on the legal aspect, on the legal dimension of this whole thing. Because the, the point I would like to raise is, yes, all legal systems are carefully designed to resist a certain level of non-compliance, a certain level of violation of its legal standards, of its legal rules, but a certain level, a certain level. So it's a matter of legal analysis to 
to set the line in which a level of violation brings about a crisis not only of efficacy, of efficiency of that legal system, but also credibility and legitimacy. And the narrative I heard from the Polish case, wow, wow, that is something. I mean, non-compliance with the rulings of the European Court of Justice, non-compliance with the rulings of the European Court of Human Rights, and non-compliance with the rulings of the judicial system from within because of the, of the experience of, of the Pegasus spyware. But the point I would like to make is, according to your knowledge, Mr. Klitschke, as legal analyst expert on the matter, have you, have you taken a look to uh, the, the, the comparative uh, standards which are available throughout the European Union member states landscape because there are some member states in which Yes, there are specific provisions to authorize the interception of the confidentiality of data and private communications. Yes, under judicial authorization. Yes, with the legal mandate of eliminating all content, all data which have been intercepted, which have nothing to do with the subject matter of the criminal investigation. Of course, on very specific grounds, under justification, under motivation of the judicial resolution authorizing it, and, and yet, more than that, there are also legal standards for exerting parliamentary scrutiny on the way those tools are actually used, the way those legal provisions are actually implemented. Is there any such thing as a, as a, as a, a, a reference in the, in the comparative legal analysis by which we may assume that that kind of a spyware is not utterly incompatible with the standard of protection of confidentiality of data and private communications of the European Union, which is the highest in the world, the Charter of Fundamental Rights, Data Protection Regulation, Law Enforcement Directive, the highest standard in the world, which is violated in such a manner by this, by this spyware, the, 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 the point I'm making is, according to your view, is it compatible with the EU standard protecting the confidentiality of data or not? Because maybe we can conclude that if it's incompatible, the only thing we can do is to rule it out, to wipe it off, to make it illegal. If, if, if there's some way of making it compatible, we should think of a regulation better than the one we have, which is the suggestion you made. I would like to see your views, and, and, and of course, if there's any other comment from, from the other panelists, I would also appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Lopez Aguiara. Indeed, uh, I will first pass the floor to Mr. Klitski for also the Polish context, but I think on the, the general question of compatibility, also very eager to listen to the other two speakers. So, Mr. Klitski first, uh, and then we, we, we continue with the other two panelists. Mr. Klitski. Thank you for your question. I think that in each member state, there are certain tensions between the issue of protection of rights and freedoms of individuals. And the rights of the intelligence services and the police, which possess more and more technology, including Pegasus. The question on whether within the European Union there are examples of best practices and the best ways to protect rights and liberties, well, we could give examples of this. One example. In today's meeting, well, today's meeting is an example. I heard a few minutes ago the situation in Spain. If I understood correctly, that the court checks if evidence has been obtained legally. In Poland, the court 
can't obtain this information. It may not know what technology has been used to collect information by the services in the country. With regard to the solutions or inspiring examples, an example which we could take as a reference within the European Union, I think that we can best draw this type of comparison regarding the work of the agencies. They publish analyses showing us how all states of the Union provide guarantees on protection of their citizens, particularly concerning these risks we're talking about. But in fact, your role could be to standardise things. Regardless of standards, you, uh, or rather, even if there are no standards, we could inspire, we could take inspiration from what is done in certain member states. It would be ideal for there to be standardisation of practices. So that, with regard to these standards and procedures, the European Union could come up with some mechanisms to apply minimum standards in all member states. But currently this doesn't exist, and the situation of Poland shows this. It shows that provisions which may provide sufficient protection, well, these texts are simply not respected. And no one, not the European Commission, nor any institution, has acted in an efficient way to change the situation. Thank you. Uh, the general question of compatibility, uh, you have the floor. Um, thank you. Um, so. The way spyware is currently deployed, especially Pegasus, that can potentially extract all possible kinds of information uh, from your smartphone. Um, we, I agree with the Europe, European Data Protection Supervisor that since our, this, is, this is your entire digital life that is extracted, and this is likely to compromise the essence of the right to privacy, which means it is not permitted under European Union law. Uh, I also don't think there's a member state in the European Union that has adequate legal protection and safeguards for deployment of spyware. So in the current situation, the right thing to do is a moratorium on the use of spyware in criminal investigations and, and, and national security intelligence. This is not to say that in the long run, proper safeguards can be developed. Uh, and I would again point to the... Um, um, en encryption position paper that, that, that Adrian published last week, where we um, actually set out 11 conditions for um, lawful use of, uh, of government hacking, as we call it, or spyware in this case. Um, and I would say one, one of them uh, is ensuring that the information extracted is only what is relevant for the uh, particular investigation at hand. So this cannot be ensured by, by technical means because sort of by design, uh, the technology would, would uh, extract all possible kinds of information uh, or, and, uh, and all conversations uh, from, the, uh, from the smartphone. But it could be possible to have an, a completely independent authority, say a court uh, that issues the, uh, the court order for, for the deployment of spyware, that, also, that is the only entity that, that receives the information and then filters it, filters it and deletes everything that is not relevant for the particular investigation. That, could, uh, that, is, that is one of the 11 conditions uh, uh, in, in, in our position paper. And based on that and many other safeguards, including mandatory notification, when it can no longer interfere with the uh, uh, investigation, um, could perhaps lead to a situation where spyware can be deployed in the rare situations where this is the option of last resort and absolutely critical for 
investigation of very serious crime or, or terrorism. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Vallejo, if you'd like to add something as well. Gracias, Chairman. Thank you, Chairman. I would add two issues. One has to do with the concept, as mentioned by Jasper Lund, the supervisor considers that it's necessary to almost totally uh, ban the use of these tools which can extract information on the people concerned. A less drastic option as the other rapporteur commented would be to take into account the intensity. In our opinion, the scale and the level of information that it's able to extract, theoretically, we think it's incompatible with the standard for protection of privacy, as it is, and probably with any sort of tool such as Pegasus would have an effect, an equivalent effect. If we want to go from a potential moratorium to a, a full ban, or if we want to leave things as they are, and consider that it's, that it's just a tool, and if it's used correctly then it could have positive effects, as the previous speaker said, there would be a third way, or a fourth way, which would be to reserve the use of tools such as Pegasus and similar tools exclusively for the most serious crimes and always with authorization right from the start by a judge. And here I'm referring to the North American system and the FISA, the Foreign Intelligence Surveillance Act, which requires a specialised judge when the intervention is going to lead to interference in the information of the affected person. So the judge, um, there will be an independent court session and this would only be reserved for the most serious crimes under the North American system. Well, it's had its pros and cons because it's all in the hands of intelligence agencies. When we're talking about this sort of tool, we know that it leads to undesirable effects. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Soleil. Uh, thank you, Chairman. I have a, a question for, for each of the, of the panelists. Um, I will start with the question addressed to Mr. Uh, Klitschke. Um, so we are having this uh, debate over whether the EU has uh, competence or not to intervene uh, somehow in the, in the use or misuse of uh, spyware tools in some member states under uh, circumstances, as we have seen, uh, that seem to be uh, far away uh, to have to receive any kind of uh, justification uh, within uh, democratic uh, societies. And in this sense, uh, I'd like to ask you whether you consider that the EU is falling short, not only uh, addressing member states' lack of independent investigation and remedies over the use of Pegasus, but also uh, on addressing the infringements of the EU legal framework on data protection, uh, especially the Law Enforcement Directive, GDPR, and eventually or potentially uh, e-privacy. Uh, then, secondly, <clears throat> next question is to Mr. Uh, Lund. Um, you have explained that uh, there is uh, legal uncertainty concerning the e-privacy directive, whether, whether the current uh, legislation um, protects uh, 
uh, against the use of uh, spyware tools like uh, Pegasus and the likes, uh, you have put forward an argument uh, in favor of, uh, of um, that protection and one another in, uh, against uh, the protection according to the current, uh, to the current rules. So my, my question uh, is, uh, what should be uh, changed or improved uh, in, the, in the current and ongoing uh, negotiation to the um, new e-privacy uh, regulation in order to make it an, an effective tool against the use of such uh, spyware tools? What, what, what would be the necessary changes in the, in the current uh, legislation that we should see as the outcome of the of the current um, negotiation, and and finally to to Mr. Vallejo, and and for this I will switch into into Spanish. Um, it seemed, and correct me if I'm wrong, that you were saying that in Spain communication can be intercepted in specific exceptional cases without authorization from the court. I would like to know, what are these cases? Can you give any examples? And if interceptions or spying with a political motive, as we know that there has been in Spain, particularly with regard to the Catalan Gate case, which some of us have been direct victims of, would this come under these exceptions? We had the opportunity to explain a few days ago in the hearing of delegates, MEPs who had been victims of spyware, a number of cases, and it seems that for uh, some of these cases had had legal authorization and some hadn't. So, I would like to know what these exceptions are. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Soli. We'll take the, uh, the questions in the order as they were asked. So we'll start with Mr. Klitsky on the, the EU competences and whether they're falling short on, the, um, uh, on safeguarding those. Mr. Klitsky. Thank you for your question. I'll reply on a fairly broad level to also cover what was said by the previous speaker a few minutes ago. So here we're talking about maintaining the possibility to use tools such as Pegasus in situations which are very specific in the case of serious crimes. This is a doll we may leave open, but which is quite dangerous. I can give you an example. A few days ago, the Polish parliament was approving or looking at a, a legal proposal to broaden the definition of spying, which is a serious crime. But it was broadened to such a point that any communication of information to a foreign institution such as your parliamentary committee, where I am today, could be considered as, a, as spying, which is a serious crime. The context concerning the rule of law and the impartiality of the court and of the intelligence services, the police, judges, etc., show that these serious crimes can, well, people who aren't, don't have a criminal profile at all can be accused of these crimes. So I would respond that yes, for me, the use of Pegasus in the broadest way possible is not subject to enough scrutiny in Poland 
this should be taken very seriously by the uh, EU bodies and it's an issue which is closely linked to the rule of law because for as long as we have even a possibility that these tools can be used in the electoral context well the results of elections in Poland will be subject to doubt whether for national or European elections Lund for the question on what should be improved in the e-privacy you have the floor um, thank you um, so what Ideally speaking, if we want the privacy regulation to protect against deployment of spyware, the most obvious way would be to clarify that the protection of the, the right to protection of the terminal equipment uh, not just includes um, actions by commercial actors such as Google placing cookies on your device, um, uh, Wi-Fi tracking of your smartphone and, and so forth, but, but also deployment of spyware by commercial act uh, by, by governments of course um, I think that should that that could be done with uh, fairly modest changes of the uh, of the um, of the proposal and the positions of, of Parliament and, and council in trilogues um, although usually what happens in trilogues as you all know that the, the outcome is somewhere between the Parliament and, and council position uh, but even even so uh, there are some Minor modifications of the recital for the um, uh, interference with terminal equipment that may increase the, the probability of it also applying to, to spyware because the recital mentions the Charter of Fundamental Rights and the European Convention of Human Rights. And in another recital, uh, so called IMSI caches, uh, false base stations used to. Uh, actually can be used to deploy spyware and, and, uh, and uh, wiretap mobile communications are also mentioned as, as possible interferences and this sort of takes us out, the, out of the normal commercial framework that um, at least characterizes the current e-privacy directive um, unless obligations are imposed on, on service providers covered by the directive. Um, so the privacy, future e-privacy regulation may apply to a wider set of interferences with the, uh, the right to privacy and uh, data protection, including actions by governments deploying spyware. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Lund. I fully share your frustration with our trilogues. Life would be much easier if the council would just adopt the parliament's position in all cases, but unfortunately it's what we have to live with. Mr. Uh, Vallejo on... Uh, the specific cases in Spain without court authorization. Okay. Gracias por su pregunta. Thanks for your question. Firstly, I'll answer the first two things that were asked. Firstly, in what cases does the law provide for interception of communications without prior authorization by a judge? I, I'm not sure I remember all the details, but I'll try not to get it wrong. There's a certain article in criminal law which establishes that very serious crime and those which have to do with uh, physical harm to people constitutes an exception to the need for prior legal authorization. But there's a caveat to this. What is ruled out is prior legal authorization, that is to say that just afterwards, this intervention should, must be approved by the judge investigating the case. If the investigating judge considers that the intervention was not necessary, then, then they cannot use any information obtained in this way. It has to be ruled out. So that's with regard to the exception to prior legal authorization. The second question about whether spying or the uh, interception of communication, communication for political reasons, uh, it's, there's nothing to do with legal authorization, here, legal authorization here. Why? Well, because if spying is for political reason, reasons, then it's going to fall into the case of serious crimes which 
could constitute a serious threat to life of persons. To sum up, if there's a political motivation, well, it's not subject to this authorization. Not uh, for intelligence agencies, nor in any other case. That is to say that in all cases it falls outside the scope of um, of these interventions. How much, Ms. Neumann? Thank you, Mr. Chair, and thank you, all speakers. And I think we are slowly approaching the heart of the subject matter. Um, this committee, as well as many of journalists and researchers, have clearly established that we have seen a misuse of spyware outside the European Union, but also inside the European Union. And as the chair pointed out, uh, at least here we agree that this is an issue of fundamental rights and as such a part of our legislative um, competence on EU level. We know that member states, by a matter of self-declaration, uh, consider this to be an issue of national security interests. Um, the issue now is, I mean, we can, as a European Parliament, together with the Commission, do some legislation on the subject matter to better regulate, for example, uh, the use of spyware, but the Council, so Member States can just block it because they leave it, uh, they block it and they leave it untouched and we remain stuck in trilogue. Uh, so we are in a deadlock while spyware continues to be misused. So my question to the experts now is, how do we get out of this deadlock? Is there a way out? And what happens with the spyware in the meantime? Is it automatically put on hold because we clearly established it's being misused and um, there is no legislative framework to solve it? Or can they continue to use it? I mean, how do we deal with it from a legal matter? Because if it's blocked legally, there's just so much we can do as, a pol as politicians. So here I would uh, very much uh, like to get your advice. I mean, if possible, on how we can make them stop using the spyware until we sorted out the legal mess. Thank you very much. Uh, let's start with the, the reverse order now. Mr. Vallejo, if you would like to respond. Sí, gracias por su... Thank you for your question. I think that the key to everything we're talking about is what you just said. In our opinion, the regulations that we have at European level, it's enough to stop the use of these tools. That's in general terms for the motives stated by the data protection supervisor in any case. We have to encourage new legislation to perhaps add more levels of procedures. We need to know what the current legislation is to see if it can be banned which is the most extreme case or if it, there can be a moratorium on it. Something very concrete is the possibility or the scope of the action that the Pegasus tool allows. It could be Pegasus or something with a different name. So the scope of the interception that this allows may go against or go against the principles of um, certain EU principles. So the argument that it's just a tool and that its correct use shouldn't breach regulations is probably wishful thinking. Anything is possible. It could be used for good or for ill. But we know that these tools provide scope for actions which are easier in this case. And so 
if new, new legislation could perhaps lead to a moratorium or a complete ban. Thank you, Mr. Lund. Um, thank you. Um, so, in terms of legal avenues, if the uh, European Union is not able to agree on legislation blocking this, or sort of uh, banning this uh, throughout Europe, uh, I mean, similar proposals could be adopted in each individual member state. Um, in, at least in, in, in theory, there, there might be the same opposition, of course. Uh, uh, Individuals could also to act, take action uh, before the European Court of Human Rights. Uh, cases have been brought to the European, to the, uh, European Court of Human Rights. Um, a, a recent one in, in Bulgaria with, a, with adjustment in, in January, I think, where people essentially complained that they had no effective remedies against secret surveillance. Uh, and certainly deployment of spyware fits that even more accurately than uh, traditional wiretapping of, of telephone services. These are, both of these uh, avenues are slow processes. Uh, so what, what might stop this or uh, slow down uh, the, uh, the use of, of spyware in, the, uh, in sort of short to medium uh, term, I think is simply better technical protection of our devices. Um, device manufacturers and especially uh, uh, software developers of the of the operating systems and the the app services running on our devices should have better protection uh, against uh, uh, spyware. Uh, I'm sure the uh, you have heard um, uh, testimony from from uh, uh, some of these uh, companies uh, before this committee, and there is a genuine interest, uh, uh, or sort of a an agreement between them and their users that the protection against spyware should be as good as, as, as possible. Um, just, this is used by governments for illicit purposes. The same software vulnerabilities can also be used for criminals. So it's, it's really in, in everybody's interest to, to protect that. What can be done as sort of at the political level is uh, ensuring that governments and intelligence services, other government agencies, do not stockpile vulnerabilities, but make them available to, um, to software developers and device manufacturers as soon as possible uh, so that they can be fixed and people can be protected. And this will not completely stop the use of spyware, but it will certainly drive up the cost of finding new vulnerabilities and make deployment of spyware more uh, expensive, uh, which usually has the way of ensuring proportionality in sometimes in similar ways to, to the, way that, the way that courts can do it. Um, these are just a couple of suggestions from, from my side. Thank you very much. And then Mr. Klitski. Thank you very much indeed for the question. Thank you very much indeed for your question. Indeed, you're absolutely right. It's, a, it's very much a key issue. Indeed, it goes right to the heart of the problem. We do need to look at how we can improve enforcement. The Member States may be making recommendations, but it falls down at the stage of enforcement. I'd have to say I quite agree with many of the points that have been made by the members today. It's perfectly possible to carry out umpteen investigations. It's possible to bring courts, it's possible to bring cases before the national courts and before the European Court of Human Rights. People who have been victims of phone surveillance or wiretapping can do this, but whether or not they will get any satisfaction when the case is finally resolved is a completely different question. So I think that we could be really witnessing a bit of an arms race here. It's not just a question of technology. If you have the law, you need to enforce it. The law is only as good as the enforcement. And without the law and the requisite tools, we won't be able to scale back, let alone eliminate wiretapping and phone surveillance. And all these other breaches of fundamental rights. So really, it's a question of enforcement and ensuring that human rights, that individual rights and freedoms, which are protected through these mechanisms of the rule of law, are actually protected in the way that in law intended. Thank you.
Muchas gracias, Presidente. Thank you very much. I'd like to thank the experts, and I have to apologise to you that I had to be present in other committees, therefore I've not actually been able to hear the full presentations. But luckily, my assistants have been and my colleagues have been following the entire hearing, and they've kept me up to date. I think it's very important for us to look at these issues. We've got to give people more rights to assert their rights in the case of uh, the, of uh, surveillance and phone tapping, especially if it's practiced by a private company. There, this is really an integral part of the social contract which we have with our society, and we therefore have to ensure that we can implement it. We have to ensure that companies are operating for the best interests and in the best interests of their citizens. So there's much that we need to look at here. We're really talking about the rule of law, about judicial scrutiny, about international law, which is, should have a binding status and should be enforced. The points were made by Angel Vallejo about the need to ensure that we have effective tools and that they're enforced is really very valid. I think we have to act upon that as quickly as we possibly can. And we've also to realise that Yes, there are questions of national security at stake, but the European Union has very real powers here and it really ought to be regulating this as effectively as it possibly can and ensuring enforcement too. Thank you. Muchas gracias por su, por su. Thank you very much for your points and your questions. What I would say is this. First of all, whether there's a need for any new legislation. And whether that is really what we need to tackle Pegasus and all the implications that flow from it. First of all, I'd have to say I don't actually think so. But let me expand on that a bit. The reality is that we have law in place if it is enforced effectively. To be enforced effectively, it has to be enforced to the ultimate. It has to go through all the tribunals and courts to the highest level. And I think often this is not possible or this has not happened. There's a tendency for us to think that more regulation is the solution. And we sometimes make the regulations even more complicated. And that actually masks what the real problem is. And often the real problem is enforcing the rights that you have. Sometimes the legislation in itself would actually be adequate for people to invoke their rights and to take them to court and to be vindicated at the appropriate uh, in, in the appropriate jurisdiction in terms of the national jurisdictions i think that article 42 of the treaty on the functioning of the european union does clearly say in terms of national security that it's in the purview, within the exclusive purview and competence of the member states. Therefore, what we might envisage would not be complicating this by trying to superimpose some level of European legislation here. This would not be the appropriate way to address this problem in the slightest. And just in conclusion, I would add to this that given the current debate about the treaty, we need to ensure that we don't tread into the area of a national security because it's not within the competence of the EU, certainly not at the moment. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. I'll just add a couple of questions of myself and then uh, the other two speakers can also maybe reflect on the uh, on the wider context of the question of Mr. Zoido, and then also please feel free to make, to make any concluding um, remarks. Because I thought in the, in the previous um, contribution of Mr. Lund, uh, you spoke about stockpiling of vulnerabilities, which is something we've discussed uh, on, on several occasions already. Do you think uh, sort of making an end to stockpiling of vulnerabilities, that something like that is feasible with European-wide legislation, or would we need other instruments uh, for that? How do you see in that regard also the, the trade 
uh, in, in vulnerabilities? Is there something we can do to regulate um, to regulate that? And the same goes for minimum standards. If you say that we need to protect our technology better, uh, do you think there is any value in, in having sort of minimum standards for for technological applications, both in terms of software and um, and hardware? Then a second question is, um, it's not, of course, only a European issue. Uh, and and uh, we, we talk a lot about European legislation, which might be very helpful in, in, in addressing the situation in Europe, but it's very much a global issue. And is there any way we, we can do uh, at, at, a, at a global level? We've spoken about the Wassenaar Agreement uh, on, on, a, on a number of occasions. Uh, what would need to be done in that regard to, to not only address this in, in Europe, uh, but also globally? And is there a risk that if we adopt certain legislation in the European Union, but not outside the European Union, that we don't solve the issue, but we simply move it to um, to outside of the EU. Uh, and then I had uh, two more questions. One, we spoke a lot about uh, judges, uh, national courts, uh, also uh, victims should address themselves to, natural, uh, to national courts or the European court. Uh, the question is, of course, uh, in the context of rule of law issues in certain of our member states, uh, is is a, a procedure for a national court really a realistic scenario? And even if we have rules on judicial approval or judicial authorization, uh, is that really uh, an appropriate checks and balance uh, in, in the case of certain member states where we see huge problems with independence of, of judiciary? And then last question, uh, we spoke a lot about victims as well. Uh, what is the, the legal standing also with the current regulations and laws of, of indirect victims. Uh, just, I mean, we spoke to, to Mr. Girti from Poland. He was the lawyer uh, also for Mr. Tusk. Uh, so by spying on Mr. Girti, they could have also spied on the president of the European uh, Council at that time. Uh, journalists who have been targeted that might have been uh, indirectly also been spying on their sources. We have here in the European Parliament a number of colleagues uh, that were targeted, which means that Either of us that were in conversation with these people could have been uh, indirect victims of, of the use of this kind of spyware as well. So, what is the what is the the, the, the legal context of, of such indirect victims um, of, of spyware? Um, let me maybe also take the reverse order. So, we start with Mr. Klitsky, uh, and then also feel free because we're running towards the end of our hearing, uh, this part of our hearing, to to make any any additional concluding remarks that you would like. Mr. Glitsky, you have the floor. Dziękuję, Panie Przewodniczący. Po pierwsze, zacznę od tej kwestii, którą poruszył Pan w drugim swoim pytaniu dotyczącym niezależności sądów i tego, czy ich kontrola nad wykorzystywaniem Pegasusa i innych oprogramowań wystarczy. Po pierwsze, w Polsce sądy mają, bez względu na swoją niezależność, sądy mają związane ręce. Rules that govern the courts, of course, and we have rules on admissibility of evidence. So, if evidence has been collected clearly through the deployment of Pegasus, it can't be deemed admissible in court. Having said that, although it's been unlawfully obtained, it can't be completely excluded from the consideration of a case because this evidence has been obtained through uh, the commission of a crime. So there is an issue there as to what to do. We need to think about different types of, of uh, surveillance and how they should be regulated. In, this, in the Polish system, the judge will have all these questions referred to him or her, but will ultimately have to make a decision and give a ruling. And we'll have to make a decision which resolves the case. And it will be based on the need to 
ensure that there is ongoing scrutiny over the the companies or the operators or the bodies which have allegedly been carrying out the wiretapping because they sh cannot possibly be allowed to continue this unhindered and unscrutinised. So despite the evidence obtained being inadmissible because it was unlawfully obtained, it is nevertheless something which has to be followed up separately because there is an issue of a criminal act. And of course all this is very relevant to the whole question of the independence of the judges and their ability to carry out their mandate. I would I'd like to make a few further remarks, if I may. There are, various members have spoken about the European law context within which we are operating. And of course, it is complex because if you look carefully at the Court of Justice's case law, then you would possibly infer that the court cannot intervene in the internal matters of a member state pertaining to national security because that is purely within its sovereignty. But at the same time, if this national sovereignty argument is adduced in defence of imposing obligations on a telecoms company and forcing it to do certain things, then the European Union absolutely should have the right to intervene. And it does have the right to intervene because it is entitled to act on the way in which the intelligence services and the telecommunications companies operate. That is within the purview of the European Union. And this is where an information control body or an information scrutiny body could actually legitimately intervene. So there is this grey area, but there is at one and the same time very much a door which opens up an opportunity for the European legislator and the European supervisory bodies to play an effective role and require accountability. It is, of course, essential to be able to have some comeback against those who are using Pegasus and other such programmes to obtain information unlawfully and to tamper with people's devices. And indeed, it is absolutely right that the European Union, because of the principles of fundamental rights, should provide adequate redress for individuals. And this is one of the most effective ways in which we can actually tackle the abuses which are going on, making sure that the victims do have absolutely uh, cast iron guarantees of uh, rights of redress and compensation. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Klitsky. And we pass the floor to Mr. Lund. Um, thank you. Um, on the question of stockpiling vulnerabilities, um, so the, as, as I mentioned, this is important for ensuring that, that vulnerabilities in software are fixed as soon as possible so that at cybersecurity attacks, uh, including spyware deployment, um, is made uh, ideally not not made possible. It is not by by exploiting these vulnerabilities, and I think there are very good cases to be made that governments should not stockpile these these such, such vulnerabilities. And these cases, these arguments have, are not just connected to fundamental rights uh, that that we are discussing today, but also economic arguments because. Uh, Cybersecurity attacks using uh, software vulnerabilities is a huge cost for the uh, for the uh, IT uh, IT, secu uh, IT security uh, sector. In the European Union, we have adopted the uh, NIST directive, followed by the NIST two directive, Network Information Security Directive. In uh, and I'm sure there'll, there'll be more because this is a huge issue. Um, and something like the uh, the WannaCry um, ransomware that that um, was spreading a couple of years ago, that was actually based on a software and vulnerability stockpiled by the NSA and then leaked from the NSA to criminals and exploited by criminals for ransomware purposes. 
if there had been a responsible disclosure policy in place, uh, the NSA would not have stockpiled this information, but uh, informed, in this case, Microsoft, so that uh, it, it, it could be fixed and, and these fixes could be uh, implemented on, on, secure, on, on IT systems throughout the world. Um, on the second question, uh, is this, this is... This is clearly not an EU issue. It is a global issue. Uh, the internet is a global space. Um, but that is not to say that EU actions, even EU actions uh, alone, would be in vain. Because the, the point about uh, uh, not stockpiling vulnerabilities but disclosing them to, to software uh, vendors instead um, matters it only needs. It only requires a single responsible government to disclose the information, rather than stockpile it for the vulnerability to be fixed and everybody to be safe and protected, even against the rogue state that would never uh, um, in, inform the software vendor of the vulnerability, but rather stockpile it and uh, and use it, uh, as well as cyber criminals, of course. So the more the better. But uh, even if the European Union just did this on its own, it would have a it would have an effect. Uh, and if we are also discussing a moratorium or partial moratorium on deployment of spyware, combined with the economic arguments in favor of not, not stockpiling vulnerabilities, but rather uh, responsible disclosure and informing the software vendors, uh, that would be a good start. And it would be a good start for doing treaties with other responsible governments, uh, United States, government in South, Canada, government in South America, and uh, Australia, so forth. Uh, uh, possibly even China might have an interest in this because China also has a huge uh, IT sector that that is, is threatened by uh, these vulnerabilities. So it's not entirely the same situation as Vazanar, where you're sort of controlling the the um, controlling information that is always difficult. This is about. Uh, making information available to software vendors so that security vulnerabilities can be fixed as, as soon as possible. Um, on my closing arguments, I, I would like to, uh, since the issue of international law was brought up in one of the, uh, the last questions, um, I would like to mention that so the, the deployment of spyware um, actually affects international law because it's done across borders. Uh, and in effect, member states that are deploying spyware in other member states or in other states are really taking actions on the territories of other states. Uh, normally, we would not accept this. Uh, so within the European Union, we have uh, sort of measures on judicial cooperation, where sometimes this is permissible, but only in accordance with EU law. Otherwise, it would be seen as a violation of uh, state sovereignty. Uh, and in principle, this, in my opinion, is the same for deployment of spyware against persons on the territory of, of another state. So there are also international law issues to, to consider here. Um, and finally, uh, my concluding remarks, the, the way forward, I think, is a mix of possible solutions, uh, technical, technical solutions, improving cybersecurity practices, combined with responsible disclosure, not stockpiling vulnerabilities, can do a lot. Um, and we need to couple that with, uh, wherever possible, uh, legal measures, uh, ideally legislation at the European Union level, protecting uh, the confidentiality of communications against deployment of spyware, which would also apply against national security, because that would inter be interfering with a right provided for by, by EU law. Um, and possibly in, in, in some member states, um, complaints to the uh, European Court of Human Rights would, uh, would be appropriate if the domestic legal framework is completely lacking safeguards against, um, say, deployment of spyware, then it might be possible to, to take cases directly to the uh, European Court of Human Rights. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Mr. Lund. And last but not least, Mr. Vallejo. Gracias, Mr. Chairman. Um, primero las preguntas. Thank you. Read the questions. Judicial independence, first of all. In principle, we consider this whole area to be more a political issue than one for experts. But we are clear about a number of points. If, for example, there is no 
real separation of powers between the executive and the judiciary, then there is an issue which we would need to look at. We th would be clear that if there isn't proper judicial independence, then the government would have to resolve that. And if it's not possible to have judicial intervention, which is independent, then there is a serious issue which has got to be resolved in order to provide a fair redress for potential victims. One of the members asked about redress for individual victims. Now, there are rights to privacy which should be protected and there are clearly direct victims of a breach of privacy but not necessarily as yet an indirect victim of a breach of privacy. This is not something which so far has been identified. The person who's being investigated or surveilled is the person who is a direct victim of the abuse but there is not an indirect victim and therefore there is no separate definition of that. In Spain, the victim of such a breach would actually have some direct redress. The indirect victim, to the extent that they existed, would have only indirect channels through which they could try to assert their rights because the breach of their rights has taken place indirectly through the medium of somebody else's rights being breached. And then ultimately, I think that sometimes people lose sight of a number of points, which is that the right to privacy is extremely relevant throughout many different aspects of life. And we have to look at it offline in the same way as we have to look at it online. It's much more than simply the violation of a law because it has a direct impact on the whole spirit and principle of the European Union and the principle of the rule of law. And if citizens feel that there is surveillance which is not under any sort of control, then they lose their faith and trust in the constitution, in democracy and in the principle of the rule of law. Because if they think that there is any type of surveillance going on, with the connivance or even just condoned or the lack of knowledge of this of the state through inaction then for example they start to lose faith in the state and they question things such as the free press and it there can be a real domino effect and that's extremely worrying thank you thank you very much mr uh, vallejo thank you very much mr lunda mr klitsky it was a very very informative and and, and uh, very substantive uh, session this afternoon and you've given us a lot to to digest uh, also in the um, uh, in the upcoming months of our work in this committee and as a parliament as a whole on some of the legislative files so thank you very much for your contributions thank you for your willingness to uh, uh, to to exchange with us it was very useful and uh, we hope that you will uh, stay involved you'll be willing to to stay involved in our investigation and our work for the the remainder of our mandate thank you Thank you very much. It's, it's very much appreciated. And we then uh, move to the second panel of today. I invite uh, Mr. Klabunde to, to make it to uh, the podium. Uh, on the second panel today, uh, we have two speakers. Uh, Mr. Yanis Kuvakas, who is a senior legal officer and legal coordinator of Privacy International, uh, a UK-based registered charity that defends and promotes the right to privacy across the world. Uh, Mr. Kuvakas is with us uh, remotely, uh, so I immediately give you the floor for 10 minutes while Mr. Klabunde makes his way to the, to the podium. Mr. Kuvakas, you have the floor for 10 minutes. Great, thank you. Thank you very much. Um, I also have a presentation. I don't know if it's possible to be able to display it at the same time. Yes, Mr. Kovacas, we're ready for you. 
Okay, great. Um, so thank you very much for offering Privacy International the opportunity to give evidence before this committee for a second time. Privacy International, or PI, is a London-based non-profit that researches and advocates globally against government and corporate abuses of data and technology. For years, we have been tracking the surveillance industry, challenging unlawful surveillance before, before both national courts, as well as the European Court of Justice and the European Court of Human Rights. My opening statement today will first briefly touch on the obligations the privacy directive imposes on service providers and states, as well as the national security exemption. Second, I will try to explore the question whether the directive can apply to the use of spyware by member state authorities and accordingly trigger the applicability of the EU fundamental rights framework. Finally, I will provide a series of recommendations by Privacy International that seek to assist this committee in strengthening the rule of law and upholding the rights of millions of individuals in the EU. If we can move to the next slide, please. Um, first of all, what we refer to as e-privacy is Directive 2002-58, as we probably know, and its subsequent amendments, which protects the confidentiality of communication and lays down rules regarding tracking and monitoring. The directive should be considered as complementary to other EU laws concerning the protection of personal data, namely the GDPR. E-privacy seeks to impose obligations on communication service providers to ensure the security of their services, while it also requires member states to adopt laws that guarantee the confidentiality of communications. Accordingly, a measure taken by national authorities that allows them, for example, to access data held by communication service providers would limit the protection afforded by the directive. Therefore, it would also constitute an interference with the rights to privacy, as well as the right to the protection of personal data at certain cases. Next slide, please. Article 15 of the directive indeed allows for such restrictions in the form of legislative measures that can be adopted by member states. These restrictions need to be tailored to specific aims, such as the prevention or detection of crime, for example, and they also need to meet certain criteria laid down by the directive and more generally EU human rights law, such as necessity and proportionality. This will also be the case even if the measures adopted by member states pertain to national security purposes, a topic that has been already widely discussed in this committee. Even though several member states, including Poland and Hungary, have in the past sought to exclude them from the ambit of EU law by relying on Article 4, Paragraph 2 of the Treaty of the European Union, they will still fall under the ambit of the Directive. Next slide, please. Recently, in a case brought by Privacy International, the Court of Justice clarified that national security measures imposing data retention obligations on service providers would still fall under the e-privacy directive, because they would require the processing of data by service providers. According to the Court, the crucial element is where the member states are imposing processing obligations on companies. In other words, in order for these companies to provide the data to governments, they would, have, they would first have to process them under their e-directive obligations. And this confirms that EU law would still be applicable in this case before the data is transferred to the relevant government authorities, for example. This brings me to my second point, which is somewhat arcane, but rather interesting. Could the privacy directive still be relevant when spyware tools are used by national authorities of member states? The crucial issue, according to the case law, and as Mr. Lund flagged in his presentation earlier, seems to be the processing of data by service providers. Spyware, however, as we know, does not always require the involvement of providers of electronic communication services, because they allow for remote, real-time access to terminal equipment to the, use, to the devices of users. Next slide, please. Article 5 of the e-privacy directive, also known as the cookie provision, might help answer this question in the affirmative. Paragraph 3 of the article prohibits the storing of information and, perhaps more crucially, the access to information already stored on devices of users without their consent. So there could be perhaps an analogy that we could draw here to apply spyware uh, even under this provision of the privacy directive. However, this approach has not been tested in courts yet, and it will be interesting to see what stance the Court of Justice of the EU will follow in a preliminary question referred to it recently by an Austrian court. Additionally, 
We could perhaps take a theological interpretation of the directive and the rights it seeks to protect and argue that the deployment of spyware would somehow still involve the passive um, processing of communication service providers as the devices infected with spyware would still be running on their networks. And as mentioned earlier, the directive requires providers to take all necessary measures to ensure security of their networks, which would therefore be a compromise through the deployment of the spyware tools. What further adds to this legal uncertainty is the fact that these rules are contained in a directive and not a regulation. This means that to a certain extent they are subject to member state discretion in how to transpose or enforce them. A similar situation was observed by Privacy International with regard to provisions mandating data retention. In 2017, we surveyed the legislation of 21 EU member states on data retention and we examined their compliance with fundamental rights standards. Out of the 21 member states we examined, none was then found to be compliant with the standards set by the Court of Justice of the EU in two landmark judgments, Tele2 Watson and It's a Rights Ireland. And this perhaps also uh, answers the question posed by Mr. Lopez Aguilar earlier on comparative standards. Nevertheless, it should be noted that regardless of the applicability of the privacy directive, the use of spyware by member states might still be governed by other EU law instruments, such as uh, the Law Enforcement Directive, or international human rights laws, such as the European Convention on Human Rights, which was mentioned uh, quite often already in this hearing, as well as the Convention 108. Spyware tools have an extremely intrusive nature and pose dangers for the security of both individuals, as well as the Internet as a whole. We believe that their deployment violates the essence of the right to privacy and the protection of personal data, and as such, they may, they may never be able to be compatible with human rights laws. Next slide, please. Finally, with regard to what the EU should do, there are three recommendations that we urge you to adopt. First, it is vital that any new legal instruments that seek to protect the confidentiality of communications provide for robust guarantees and even more robust enforcement. Notably, any national security exemption must be strictly applied, especially when the rights of individuals are engaged in the context of mass surveillance or government hacking. To paraphrase the case law of the European Court of Human Rights, measures that seek to protect national security may undermine or even destroy democracy under the cloak of defending it. Moreover, this Parliament must refrain from adopting proposals that seek to undermine one of the best defences against surveillance, encryption, by pursuing well-intentioned but flawed policies, such as those contained in the European Commission's proposal on, com on combating child sexual abuse material. Second, proposals that seek to establish EU-wide databases, such as data retention, must prioritise strong security to protect personal data. They must ensure that the collection of data is minimised and retained only for the shortest time necessary for the purpose. This is not only due to the several issues they raise with regard to their compatibility with human rights laws, but also due to the threats they present for the security of everyone's data. Incidents like the WannaCry and NotPetya cyber attacks stemmed from the exploitation of similar vulnerabilities and escalated to compromising European infrastructure operators in their areas of health, energy, transport, finance and telecoms. Third, the EU must mandate long-term software support for connected devices. Our research has revealed how existing practices of device manufacturers around security updates fail to meet the expectations of the vast majority of consumers. At the moment, there are two important legislative proposals discussed in Parliament, the Directive on Empowering Consumers and the EU Cyber Resilience Act. It is imperative that both these texts ensure that people's devices do not become vulnerable to malicious third-party attacks. In sum, PI believes that this committee is presented with a unique opportunity to uphold the fundamental rights of millions of citizens. We are confident that it will live up to its challenging task and promote democracies where people are free to be human, both offline and online. Thank you for your attention and I'm looking forward to your questions. Thank you very much, Mr. Mustakovakis. Thank you also for already referring to some of the questions from the earlier part.
of our of our hearing. That's very very helpful. Uh, and I now invite um, Mr. Klabunde to do uh, the same. You have ten minutes to take the floor. You represent the Deutsche Vereinigung für Datenschutz, uh, which is an independent civil rights association that campaigns for data protection issues in Germany and in Europe. And I would ask the members who would like to participate in the Q and A session to to indicate so so we can make the speaker list. Mr. Klabunde, you have the floor. Thank you, Dem Kubauer, Mr. Lenatz. But I will speak uh, in English, not in Dutch or German. Thank you, uh, Mr. Chair. Um, I'm here uh, representing Deutsche Vereinigung für Datenschutz, which is an NGO of which I have been a member for a number of years. And I want to uh, open by making a personal disclaimer, because I'm sure some of those watching this session have seen me here in this parliament in a different role when I was working for the European Commission or the European Data Protection Supervisor. I am retired in the meantime and I'm not going to refer to anything to, uh, relating to my previous work but exclusively to matters of my own research in a personal capacity and of course in that of the most expert colleagues from Deutsche Vereinigung for Datenschutz. Next slide please. Uh, just, uh, I think, uh, DVD hasn't been so often present in the European Parliament, so please uh, allow me to uh, give a few words uh, on this uh, organization. It's a civil rights organization. Uh, it would be under uh, French terms. It would in uh, ASBL or in Vereinigung uh, Sonderwinst in uh, other Belgian terms. So it's a non-profit financed exclusively by the contributions of its members and uh, proceeds from its quarterly publication, Datenschutz, Nachrichten, Data Protection News, which is unfortunately available only in German. It's been founded 1977, so at the same time when Germany received its first national data protection law. And uh, highlights of the organization's advocacy work is its participation in the German version of the Big Brother Awards annually and uh, its cooperation with other European organizations in this field in the context of ENTRI and <coughs> other connections. Next slide, please. So, uh, I would like to uh, not enter into a legal, deeper legal analysis. Um, also for the simple reason that I can fully endorse the contributions to this respect of Mr. Jesper Lund from Denmark, who was in the first panel, and the very excellent presentation of the colleague from Privacy International we all just heard. I, I didn't think I, I found a single point in these presentations which I couldn't uh, fully endorse. However, I would like to make a few remarks about the wider context of the uh, e-privacy directive as it is the current uh, instrument. Just to remind, and I think this is quite important, that the e-privacy directive is not only uh, specializing and uh, detailing the uh, data protection reviews, but that it is the most important uh, secondary law instrument implementing the fundamental right to privacy and to confidentiality of correspondence or communications, depending on whether you follow the wording of the European Convention on Human Rights by the Council of Europe or the wording of the European Union Charter of Fundamental Rights, Article 7. And of course, it acts within the context of the treaties, the Treaty on the European Union and the Treaty on the Functioning of the European Union. And uh, as I know that you know, uh, the e-privacy directive, which is still in force, pulls its definitions and some of its rules from originally Directive 9546, so the um, our data protection directive, which was like the sister of uh, the e-privacy directive because the original laws both were proposed by the Commission in 1990. And uh, as you see that 9546 took five years to pass the legislative process. And the first predecessor of the e-privacy directive was 
Directive 9766. So it still it took even seven years to to come into law. So with the current uh, legislative process now and its sixth this year of uh, continuation, you can still beat the initial benchmark of adopting a uh, instrument to ensure confidentiality of communication. So not all is lost, but both the parent instruments, as I used to call uh, the uh, uh, Data Protection Directive and the Framework Directive from the Electronic Communications Framework, which is uh, the other legal source of uh, e-privacy definitions, have in the meantime been replaced by newer instruments. The Data Protection Directive, as we all know, through the, by the GDPR, and also the Electronic Communications Framework uh, has been rewritten and is now mostly uh, contained in the directive establishing the European Electronic Communications Code. And uh, so there was good reason to uh, start the review and a new instrument for uh, confidentiality of communications with the e-privacy proposal in 2017. But uh, the difficulty of coming to a, a conclusion between the European Parliament and the Council is, of course, very present in everybody's mind here. However, what is uh, particularly frustrating in this process is that still the co-legislators found the time to cut into the substance of uh, the e-privacy directive is due to the uh, changes in the electronic communications framework, the scope of the services covered by the e privacy directive increased with the entry into force of the EECC directive, which meant that now services like email, which arguably was always covered, but also uh, messenger services uh, like those of uh, a company which uh, is currently trying to reinvent its name and, and uh, type of service, um, are now also covered. So, uh, And because these messaging services uh, historically provided a different interpretation of confidentiality of communications than those uh, used in the privacy directive, um, they got permission by the co-legislator to continue scanning um, the news that they transport in the context of uh, combating child sexual abuse material, which was uh, unfortunately the only element of a reaction of the change uh, in the electronic communications framework in the context of e-privacy, rather than moving ahead with the comprehensive um, solution that is provided with the e-privacy regulation. I just noticed there is a typo on this slide. Next slide, please. So, um, in order to uh, find a position regarding the um, actions that this committee is established to investigate and to, to put this in the context with the um, structures and elements of the privacy directive, uh, I refer to a few keywords. The main one, of course, is the confidentiality of communications, which is that not just a technicality, but it is a fundamental right in its own capacity. It's um, in this effect, I mean, it's the historically much older than the right to uh, data protection. It's uh, uh, basically here in Brussels, a historical reference is the former railway station uh, Turno Taxis, which was uh, historically a nodal point in, an in a non-electronic communications network main and network of transporting letters. And I heard, and I haven't uh, investigated and researched this, but the fact that this service was 
operating under the instruction not to open every letter and read it, but to distribute it without uh, taking knowledge of the content of the messages transferred was basically the reason for its great economical uh, success, which is still reflected in historical sites like uh, the former railway station. What I want to say here is that uh, the fundamental right to uh, secrecy of communications, correspondence, is not only a civil right which enables all the other things like free speech and uh, association and all the other things, but it is also a very, very important economic uh, factor that it, with the absence of uh, confidential communications, many businesses cannot operate, so it will also affect uh, the economy. But anyway, this, this fundamental right is already important for hundreds of years in Europe. We have um, the elements of uh, interference or tapping, and uh, just to recall here that interference is not only the illegal listening or recording or whatever, monitoring, taking knowledge of the content, but interference may also uh, lead to modifying the content of messages. Uh, my pre the previous panel speakers, in particular um, the colleague from Panopticon, already mentioned that interference with devices or with communications can also lead to creating false evidence and uh, incriminating persons for things they never did. And uh, so the integrity of devices is of a uh, strong importance. And uh, I think uh, this is also um, a field where we see uh, high risks. In Germany, at least, there is a strong debate about the management of vulnerabilities, which are weak points in the, electron in the software of uh, or hardware of uh, communications devices which may be used to create things like Pegasus or other spyware tools which are based on uh, security holes which are often not there intentionally but uh, by, by mistake. And I already mentioned uh, the fundamental rights and an important context in the context of national security is the rule of law, which is fundamental for the European Union and for democracy as such. And um, the idea that a government or a national security service just decides what is national security and is not subject to any scrutiny is, of course, incompatible with uh, the concepts of democracy. Next slide, please. So, uh, what I would ask you to do is, of course, to insist on an adoption of a meaningful e-privacy regulation, not to give in to extreme lobby-driven demands by national governments to uh, allow for all kind of uh, funny reasons to process communication data. Please stop to accept further exceptions from fundamental rights on doubtful grounds. Nobody is opposing the fight against child sexual abuse material. But we have just learned in a different context in the uh, video analysis that uh, the basis for the claims that a measure might help this fight is just based on advertising of the provider. So that's not the basis for, for legal uh, thing. And <clears throat> insist on the uh, technical integrity of networks and devices, of course, to, to see what in the uh, information security framework can be done to avoid stockpiling of vulnerabilities. And the last point is something where I could congratulate the European Parliament because uh, by saying governments must be held to account and in a field where uh, judicial redress is difficult, parliamentary scrutiny is uh, the means of uh, doing this. And so in particular in those countries where the national parliament is not given the powers to do scrutinize uh, what the national security services are doing, it is very important that uh, this parliament and this committee look into these matters to give at least some public scrutiny and some pressure on services that might otherwise think that they are uh, 
uh, entitled to impunity on the services. And next slide, please. Uh, thank you uh, for your attention and for the invitation again. Thank you very much for the, the presentation. Thank you also for the encouragement uh, of our work. And thank you very much for your, your hopeful outlook that we, <coughs> we can still beat the, the previous uh, adoption of, of, of the privacy regulation uh, by, by even a year if we, if we do our best. So thank, yeah. thank you for the optimism. Um, we move to the questions and the Q&A session of this hearing. And I pass the floor first to our rapporteur, Sophie Nesselt. Yes, thank you, Chair, and I would like to uh, thank the speakers and also apologize to the previous speakers because I was really unable to attend the first part of the meeting as I had to chair a meeting somewhere else. Um, uh, first question on um, the, 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 the Article 15 of the ePrivacy Directive, which is essentially a kind of uh, exemption or exception to, to the rule, but if I remember correctly, the ECJ has ruled that um, that doesn't mean that when, when um, uh, governments are using this exception, the Charter of Fundamental Rights still applies, because they would say it doesn't apply, because national security is, is strictly uh, national uh, competence and therefore the Charter of Fundamental Rights doesn't apply but if I understood correctly the ECJ has ruled that that is not correct because when they are for example in the case of, of data retention which is still a difficult topic but also other uh, um, other programs that may use article 15 the judge said because they base themselves on article 16 uh, 15 they are actually using the e-privacy directive, which is EU law, and therefore the Charter of Fundamental Rights reply, uh, uh, applies. Uh, and that would mean that not only data protection and the right to privacy apply, but also things like uh, right to a fair trial, for example. I would like to hear your views uh, on that. Secondly, can you say something about, um, unlike conventional wiretapping, uh, the use of spyware doesn't only concern communications and it doesn't only concern real-time communications, but it's actually uh, giving access retroactively to metadata, to uh, messages, to documents, to images, to whatever, basically, retroactively, which also means that, for example, judicial authorization loses its meaning because judicial authorization for wiretapping is usually for a particular date, uh, from date today for the next two months or so. Uh, but this is, this is retro, retroactive. Um, so I would like to hear your views on that. Um, then I, I heard, I don't know if the other speakers are still here, I don't believe so, but um, I heard the last speaker, Mr. Vallejo, say uh, something which I... I don't know if I understood correctly, but he basically said people who are part of the bycatch, in other words, they're not the direct target, but the indirect target, that they would have equal legal standing to the direct targets to go to court. Uh, that's a very interesting uh, premise, because I'm not aware that there is any such case, but I've been asking myself the question, if that is, if you're, let's say, you're very uh, close uh, colleagues with, I don't know, Mr. Andulakis uh, or Mr. Soleil, for example, you've been exchanging emails, uh, working on documents together, whatever, you share videos, um, then you're part of the bycatch. So even, uh, even if you have not been targeted by the government of, your, of, of that particular country, you could still go to court. Would you, would you agree with that assessment? I hope I, I wasn't, uh, I was clear. I mean, this is all <laughs> quite complex. I, I, I think it was clear, and if not, we, we have uh, room for follow-up questions. And on, on the question of the indirect victims, I asked those questions, and if I understood Mr. Vallejo, uh, 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 correctly, he said that technically, yes, there, there should be a standing for indirect victims as well, but he was not aware of any case where this had happened uh, already. So, uh, but um, maybe let's let's take the, um, the, the the original speaking order when we first pass the floor to Mr. Kuvakas, and then Mr. Klabunda, you uh, you can you can add to that, Mr. Kuvakas. Thank you, and thank you very much for um, both questions. They're quite interesting indeed, and it's worth uh, clarifying a few points on those. 
First, with regard to uh, the exceptions contained in Article 15 of the Privacy Directive and uh, whether the Charter applies, it's worth noting that, first of all, for the European Charter of Fundamental Rights to be applied, it has to be in the context of EU institutions carrying out activities, which would of course be under EU law, but member states as well, when it has to do with EU law. So the whole debate has been around whether the e-privacy directive can somehow be applied, because if it is applied, then we have the applicability of EU law, and accordingly the Charter comes into place. And if the Charter comes into place, what comes with it is all the human right, the fundamental rights you mentioned, as well as the guarantees of necessity, proportionality, respect for the essence of rights, and so forth. So basically, the relatively recent jurisprudence of the Court of Justice of the EU has highlighted that when a state actor is imposing an obligation, when a state, for example, adopts a law that imposes an obligation on my phone, uh, my phone company, a communication service provider, to interfere with data, retain them, provide access, store them, transfer them to another party. It is doing so in a contravention of the privacy directive because the privacy directive seeks to protect the confidentiality of communications and this form of processing, the transfer, the storing, whatever the provider does, can only be in certain cases prescribed for by the directive. However, uh, when the state requires the communications uh, service provider to do this, which is something else, which is outside of the directive, it still uh, falls under the applicability of the directive because uh, the process that the provider will develop, the process that the, 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 the communication service provider will do in order to provide access to the data would be governed by their obligations under the directive. So somehow it's like saying that yes, Article 15 of the directive provides for exceptions, but they still render what the order wants within the uh, framework of EU law, which brings the Charter into play and the applicability of the principles I mentioned. Um, it's a very... I think on several occasions the Court of Justice of uh, EU has made a very uh, interesting remark when adopting this conclusion, saying that if we were to adopt that such measures, although prescribed by the Directive as derogations, fall outside the scope of EU law, it's like depriving the directive of its essence, because essentially it's like saying that the directive provides for these exceptions and wants to regulate these exceptions, saying it's okay for the exception to be outside the scope of this instrument, it's okay to have a data retention obligation on certain ser service providers as long as you respect EU law. So if a state is, ar is arguing that this should fall outside, it's like depriving the directive of, of any meaning, because essentially there is no point to be for the exceptions to be applied. Now, when it comes to the second question around uh, the intrusiveness of spyware, and this is a really interesting remark because uh, spyware and generally tools that have been deployed in the context of government hacking that we have been looking into for years uh, are all highlighting pretty much the same conclusion of how intrusive these methods are, especially nowadays when our address books, our diaries, our personal notes, uh, our, our credit cards have all been replaced by mobile devices. Pretty much everything is kept on the phone nowadays. It's really, it's really enormous. Uh, it's really enormous access that is being provided um, to the parties that deploy spyware and government hacking techniques. This is why uh, I think that before going into judicial authorization and safeguards that you rightly mentioned which would come into play when examining whether a measure can be strictly necessary for the purpose it seeks to achieve and then proportionate. It's worth um, spending a bit more time on another condition that is imposed by the Charter of Fundamental of uh, the EU, and that is the essence of rights. Respect for the essence of rights essentially would mean that we can impose restrictions on certain rights that are not absolute, like privacy or the protection of personal data, as long as those do not interfere, do not harm the very core, the very essence of these rights. Accordingly, a similar consideration has been made by the European Court of Human Rights when it refers to the essence of rights, when it refers to dignity or human dignity being the essence of all rights prescribed in the European Convention on Human Rights. 
So, to echo the remarks that were also made by the European Data Protection Supervisor in his remarks in dated February 2022, it's very unlikely to see how, it's very almost impossible to see how spyware like the ones we have seen deployed by NSO Pegasus uh, could comply with a principle to respect the essence of these rights, considering their vast intrusiveness, their ability to destroy, alter data, introduce new data, and essentially gain an gain an immediate look into a person's very intimate aspects of their life. Because, as we said, although it might be targeted to a single person, let's say I just want to get access to the mobile phone of target named X, this access would still immediately open a door to all aspects of their private life. It's not that I just want to read one email of target X. Immediately, I'm getting all their data. Immediately, it's like I'm, follow I'm following them around or I have been following the realm, or as you rightly mentioned, with the retroactivity point for the, past, like, for the past, right now, and probably for the future. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Klabund. Thank you very much. On the, as I already said earlier, I can repeat this, that the legal interpretation of my colleague from Privacy International seems to be totally correct to me, so I would, would fully endorse it and uh, not change a, a single word in particular on the uh, interpretation of Article 15.1 of the directive. On the retroactive aspect of, of wiretapping as, uh, or of spyware as opposed to wiretapping, that of course depends on what you, what you do retroactively. I mean, it was one of the, I think, uh, Kaspar Bauden the late Kaspar Bowden needs to be credited with the observation that the data retention instrument was like a time machine for the security services because they can look half a year back in our communications where this, where this happens. So uh, this is not totally unique to spyware and of course it depends on the technical features of the device and the spyware whether they really uh, can go how far go they can go. I mean, information which isn't there in the device is uh, is lost, of course. Uh, I would like to add a point on the uh, what you call the bycatch. It's clear that in every interference with the communication, this interference concerns both parties to the communications, or as we have multi-point communications, all the parties to the to the communications, and not only the one that is targeted, but every girlfriend, service provider, car dealer or other uh, contact that they are in communication with. They are all affected by this and also their confidential information is uh, taken into the net that is uh, pulled out. Um, as a point of comparison, in, in Germany there is a law which allows, unfortunately, uh, to put bugs, listening devices into private homes under certain circumstances. But this law was, uh, as one of the uh, few uh, successes of uh, defendants of civil rights, contained a provision that they must stop listening when they enter into the very uh, core of private life in the course of a tapping operation. So, um, I mean, this is... Uh, a very bad situation which doesn't become much better but um, I think really that uh, for, the, for the parliament a wholesale solution is not possible but to add uh, internal safeguards to what is uh, requested by security services and additional checks and balances. Democracy is about checks and balances everywhere and um, we, we we just need to have effective uh, redress accountability in in the system. Thank you. Thank you very much, Saskia Brigmont. Thank you and good afternoon, evening. Um, thank you for your interventions. Um, I also try to be clear, but I have to be honest. I I. It's, it's sometimes difficult to see clear between um, is the legal framework, the current EU legal framework sufficient 
And is it basically not applied or uh, there's an abusive use of some concepts such as national security, for instance, by our member states? And then um, the, 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 the gap between the framework and the political will to act. Um, national security is um, the argument used by the four member states we know they have been using uh, the spyware wiretapping illegally. Um, do you have a view on, on, on these national situations? Do you have any, any comments when it comes to the respect of uh, proportionality and necessity? Um, I ask you that because this is the uh, official reason uh, given by the governments that have answered to us, uh, to the Commission, sorry, not to us yet. Um, and at the same time, the Commission basically seems to hide after this concept as well, uh, to, to barely uh, have no reaction. Uh, <laughs> I hear there are several pieces of legislation that could be uh, uh, used to act even when this concept of national security is mobilized, e-privacy, charter of fundamental rights. So, so basically, if a member state evokes the national security argument, the Commission doesn't act um, on the EU uh, legal basis that, uh, that uh, we have, uh, what is remaining for the victims? What can they do? Go to the court directly, and 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 that's basically all, uh, the only means that they that they have in their hands to have uh, legal redress. Um, knowing, and and it has all already been mentioned before earlier in the exchanges. Um, that we can doubt about the independence of some uh, some tribunals in our member states. Um, previous speakers mentioned so that the the, the, the current framework is uh, sufficient. Do you agree with that? Um, this is a question to to both of you. Um, and do you think? Do you have any insights on uh, possible future misuses? Thank you. Thank you very much. Let's start with Mr. Klabund this time. Thank you. Uh, thank you, and thank you for the for, for the question, uh, um, Mr. Pickman. Well, um, the I I think the the current framework is uh, of course insufficient uh, in its current form, with um, the lack of the stronger protections of the e privacy regulation proposal and with the exemption for um, the purpose of uh, child sexual abuse uh, detection is is not justified the current framework is insufficient in its dealing with the security of devices the absence of the vulnerabilities the obligation for providers to fix vulnerabilities the obligation for uh, state authorities to uh, ensure that vulnerab vulnerabilities are fixed with the providers and not used by the services itself. So I think these all are points uh, which can still be addressed in, uh, in current legislation. I find it difficult to predict what the European Court of Justice may make of um, the interpretation of the charter and secondary law to uh, prosecute or to in the in the prosecution of uh, uh, spyware cases in in member states my my colleague from privacy international has explained the difficulty of bringing the eu charter into law when it's dispute into into a case when it's disputed whether the member state was in this specific activity in, in the course of European law. But I think clarification of the scope of, of European law might help here, in particular in the field of, uh, of vulnerabilities of devices. I think there's uh, still space in uh, IT security and uh, common market uh, regulation to uh, do more for, for security and also considering the liability of device uh, providers and software providers. There has been a long uh, tra um, tradition 
of uh, exempting software from normal liabilities, and I think this this is uh, certainly a point. Uh, future misuses, yeah. Well, I I think this will never end, uh, but it's unpredictable what they what they will include. But uh, when we see, I saw a number today of uh, 21,000 vulnerabilities which have been detected since the beginning of this year. Uh, so the, the the number of uh, uh, these loopholes is um, huge and will, give, will be used by smart uh, developers in the future and be sold and used by governments with um, tendencies to uh, escape from scrutiny. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Kuvakas. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, to a big extent, I will echo what uh, Mr. Klabunde already said, with which I totally agree, and I would just like to add only a few remarks. First, with regard to the national security context, uh, there is an, I don't think that's the case for just a few member states or just a few countries around the world, to be precise. We have seen national security being used as an elastic concept where governments try to accommodate all sorts of concerns, especially in the context of mass surveillance. We have seen, for example, mass surveillance being carried out with national security always being the number one reason, and we have seen this being claimed as a very effective solution to tackle crime, to tackle threats such as terrorism, which are all legitimate reasons. However, we have barely seen, and speaking of experience, I have not seen a single case that we brought where governments were able to demonstrate the efficiency of this by bringing in specific cases where specific threats to terrorism were tackled. Of course, even in a, let's say, non-disclosure context, not with specific details, but based on the reports we've seen in the case studies, we are still, I think it's quite doubtful whether we need such a big umbrella restriction as national security has been and is currently being used by member states to justify um, interferences, severe interferences with individuals' fundamental rights. Um, if it's interesting uh, because it also reminds me, and I think this also answers your second question, of a specific uh, case before the European Court of Human Rights against Hungary. It's the case of Chabo and VC versus Hungary, a case heavily relied on by the European Court of Justice in its surveillance case law, especially the data retention context, and the case where Hungary was found to be in violation of Article 8 of the European Convention on Human Rights, which protects the, rights, the right to privacy because of the mass surveillance measures it was implementing or so to implement were failing to adhere to strict necessity principles articulated by the court. Um, on another point, and what uh, those affected or individuals being victim, uh, victims of the deployment of spyware and what they could potentially do, we should also not overlook the role of companies uh, who are facilitating these communication services. And it re this also uh, reminds me of the WhatsApp legal claim that has been brought in the US against the NSO group. Uh, WhatsApp uh, bringing a lawsuit against NSO as it uh, was used uh, to target a journalist or human rights defender uh, who used their services. Um, so perhaps this also signals to a sort of stronger obligation on companies to take security and integrity of their systems, as most of them already do and will guarantee their due, uh, to be able to fight such abuses and perhaps take action. This will also be really necessary in the cases of vulnerable communities and victims that belong to certain groups or minorities where they might not be able to seek redress uh, for the harm or damage they have suffered. Uh, when it comes to the other question on whether I believe the directive uh, is enough or a sufficient legal instrument, again echoing Mr. Klabunde, I, I would have been more inclined to say yes, I believe it is enough to regulate the deployment of spyware by member state authorities, but my answer will also be no, because first we're talking of a directive, and as I said, this brings up certain difficulties with each state choosing their own ways to transpose it, meaning that it might slightly deviate from a certain interpretation, then another state might slightly deviate a bit more, and this goes on. So imagine like all the member states we have and how hard it might be to find a uniform or consistent approach, or how often 
the European Court of Justice would have to come into play with preliminary questions. And uh, the second reason I would say no is the data retention experience, as I mentioned in my opening remarks, where more than 20 member states in 2017 uh, were found to be in non-compliance of the interpretation that even the CGEU gave uh, around standards on data retention. So it is quite questionable how much they took uh, these landmark judgments and the rules that the Luxembourg court set out into account. And uh, also it shows us an example of perhaps having a judgment by the European Court of Justice being handed down and then states not necessarily implementing it, adapting their laws or fixing the problem. Um, another remark I would like to make which brings me to the sort of, again, state obligations but from a different dimension is that of positive obligations. Uh, which basically means that states, state authorities are also obliged to guarantee the confidentiality of communications, as we saw one of the main aims uh, of the Directive on e-privacy being that, uh, as well as effectively guarantee the right to privacy, the exercise of the right to privacy of individuals and the means to do so. And an interesting remark there would be, as most communications nowadays uh, will happen in digital context, the measures that states need to undertake to ensure confidentiality, integrity of systems and security. And uh, we, see, we see various instances of um, this sort of positive obligation um, being uh, present in, very, in various EU law instruments, for example, the NIST directive or even data protection instruments such as the GDPR, the LED uh, law enforcement directive governing the processing of data by police and criminal authorities, uh, where uh, the providers of these systems or controllers, uh, if we say it in a data protection context, are obliged to maintain integrity of systems, avoid data breaches, and make sure that they don't compromise the security of systems. Now, it's hard to see whether these obligations could still be abide if, let's say, a police authority is deploying spyware, which relies on vulnerabilities and essentially target systems that can compromise the security not only of that specific device, but as we know of the security of the internet as a whole and the whole network because knowing a certain vulnerability in mobile application X it's not going to mean that I'm only going to target user that very user of the um, uh, application I will essentially create an open door for third parties cyber criminals to just gain access and possibly use the vulnerability and affect the millions or billions of users that specific application might have uh, so it's like the crossover sort of effect and yes, I think these are my three remarks to your questions. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Mr. Kuvakas. Now, we, we've almost concluded the sixth hour of our hearings today. Uh, thank you very much for all the, the presentations. Um, on the topic of um, e-privacy and, and the use of Pegasus, it's maybe not as clear-cut as we, we would have hoped. Uh, I, I join a bit of the confusion of... Uh, of Saskia Brigmont in that regard, but at the same time, uh, the lack of clarity is also an encouragement uh, for our own legislative agenda, I guess, in order to, to provide that clarity uh, in, in the future. Uh, thank you very much, Mr. Klabunde. Thank you very much, Mr. Kuvakas. Thank you very much for the diehard colleagues who have, uh, have, have spent these six hours with us today, uh, both from the, the members and the staff. So thank you very much. And we meet each other again tomorrow morning um, at nine o'clock for, for the next session. Thank you all very much. I wish you a nice evening and see you tomorrow.